Um, he works a lot on reinforcement learning theory and his main research interests were related to exploration in unsupervised RL and goal-oriented RL. Today he's going to talk to us about some recent work on stochastic shortest path, so over to you. Okay, thanks a lot Kira, for the introduction and thanks for inviting me uh, to, uh, to speak here. So uh, in this uh, presentation I'm going to present our recent work entitled Stochastic Shortest Path, Minimax Parameter Free and Towards Horizon Free Regret. This is joint work with Run Longzhu, who's a student at Tsinghua University, as well as our advisors Simon S. Du from University of Washington, Matteo Pierrotta from FAIR, Michal Valco from DeepMind, and Alessandro Lazarek from FAIR. So many popular reinforcement learning problems are goal-oriented tasks, where there is a specific goal state to reach, and the objective is to minimize the cumulative cost until the goal state is reached. And this is also coined as the stochastic shortest path problem, or SSP. And unlike other well-studied settings in RL, such as Finite Horizon, here in SSP, an episode's length is not predetermined nor bounded, and it's influenced by the agent's behavior. The setting of online learning in SSP has only been recently studied. In fact, here's a timeline of the papers that study regret minimization in SSP, where here we consider that the SSP settings considers episodes that last as long as the goal is reached. And it shows that since our first paper out late 2019, there's been a growing interest in the community on this setting of online SSP. And as a matter of fact, uh, two of these papers have already been presented here at the RL Theory Seminar. And today I'm gonna present our latest work on online SSP symbolized here with the green mic. So first I'm going to briefly review the setting of online SSP. So the environment that we consider is a stochastic shortest path Markov decision process or SSP MDP. It's composed of a state space S uh, augmented with a predefined goal state denoted by G. The action space is denoted by A. Transition probabilities are denoted by capital P. And each state action pair SA incurs a cost C of SA, which may be stochastic and which lies in the interval zero one. So here we see that the main specificity of SSP is that there exists a goal state G such that the agent ends its interaction with the environment once and if it reaches the goal state. And as such, we may cast the goal as being both an absorbing and zero cost state. So SSP MDPs are quite a general framework. In particular, both finite horizon MDPs and discounted MDPs are subclasses of SSP MDPs. So a policy pi is a mapping from states to actions. The time to goal of a policy pi denoted by T pi of S corresponds to the expected cumulative time until the goal state is reached, starting from state S and executing policy pi. We can also define the value function of a policy, also known as the cost to go. V pi of S denotes the expected cumulative cost until the goal state is reached when starting from state S and executing policy pi. And similarly, we can define the Q function of a policy starting from state action pair SA. So something quite specific and possibly technically challenging in SSP is that for many policies pi, these quantities of interest T pi, V pi, and Q pi may have unbounded components. And for example, a sufficient condition for that is if all costs are strictly positive and the policy is never able to reach the goal state. So that's why an important characterization is that of proper policies. So a policy is proper if it reaches the goal with probability one, starting from any state. And we make the basic assumption that there exists at least one proper policy, which basically ensures that the SSP problem is well posed. We denote by pi star the optimal proper policy, which is the one that minimizes the value function component wise under the constraint that the time to goal is bounded component wise. And important quantities that are gonna appear later on in the analysis are B star, which bounds the value function of the optimal policy starting from any state, and T star, which bounds uh, the time to goal of the optimal policy starting from any state. So how do we define online learning in SSP? So we consider that the transitions P and the cost function C are unknown to the agent, and the agent interacts with the environment in capital K episodes, where importantly, an, episodes, an episode ends if and only if the goal is reached. And the objective is to minimize the regret, which is defined as the cumulative cost incurred by the agent, 
minus uh, the optimal policy, uh, the performance of the optimal policy. That is to say, k times v pi star at the initial state. Here, i of k denotes the length of episode k. And as I mentioned before, it may be possible that uh, an episode has unbounded length. And in that case, the convention is to say that the regret is unbounded as well. So here we see that there are two main differences with respect to the way regret is defined in finite horizon. First, we evaluate the empirical performance of the agent and not the expected performance. That is to say the sum of the value functions. And second, we compete against the optimal proper policy pi star. Since recall that we have a dual objective of minimizing the value function, but also reaching the goal state. So now I'm going to identify three desirable properties that we may expect from a learning algorithm in online SSP. So first, the learning objective is to achieve a performance as close as possible to the optimal policy pi star. That is to say, the agent should achieve low regret. Rosenberg et al. showed that the regret is overbounded by B star square root of S A K, where B star bounds the value function of the optimal policy, S is the number of states, A the number of actions, and K the number of episodes. And so naturally, we're going to say that an algorithm is nearly minimax optimal if its regret is bounded by B star square root of S A K up to log factors in lower order terms. Another relevant uh, factor of consideration is the amount of prior knowledge that the algorithm requires. And in particular, there are two SSP specific quantities that appear, which are B star and T star, which respectively bound the expected value function and expected time to goal of the optimal policy. And so we say that an algorithm is parameter free if it relies neither on B star nor on T star prior knowledge. And we also identify a third desired property, which we dub horizon free. So before introducing it, let's take a step back here and recall that a core challenge in SSP is that we have possibly conflicting objectives that we want to balance. Specifically, we want to trade off between minimizing the costs and also actively trying to reach the goal state. And this actually is harder when the instantaneous costs are small or even equal to zero. And this may happen when there is a mismatch between B star and T star. So we always have the inequality that B star is no larger than T star because the costs are always between zero and one. However, the gap between the two quantities may be arbitrarily large. And in fact, it's very easy to design toy SSP problems where T star is exponentially larger than B star. So interestingly, the lower bound stipulates that the regret does depend on B star in the leading term. But a priori, it shouldn't depend on T star even as a lower order term. And so we say that an algorithm for online SSP is nearly horizon free if its regret depends only logarithmically on T star. And this becomes especially relevant when T star is very large. So here we can make uh, a connection to the recent investigation of a horizon free property in finite horizon MDPs. So very recently, Wang et al. and Zhang et al. Uh, show that it's possible to design algorithms for online finite horizon MDPs with total reward bounded by one that are nearly horizon free. That is to say, whose regret depends only logarithmically on the horizon H. So here H uh, denotes the number of time steps by which any policy terminates. And note that such notion of horizon would obviously be too strong in SSP, where many policies may never reach the goal and thus have unbounded horizon. And so this is why the natural extension that we propose to SSP is to say that an algorithm is near horizon free if a regret depends only logarithmically on T star, which bounds the expected number of time steps by which the optimal policy terminates. So here we can make a couple of remarks. First, we observe that we do not make any extra assumption on the SSP model to try to uncover horizon free properties. And this is as opposed to finite horizon MDPs, which require an extra assumption that the total reward of any trajectory is bounded by one, or at least a known constant that differs from the horizon H. And the second observation that we can make is that a claimed benefit of a bounded total reward assumption is that it can model sparse spiky rewards. And actually we see that to the extreme, this scenario can be captured by an SSP problem where the sparse spiky reward states can be modeled as goal states. 
So now I'm going to dig into our results and position them with respect to the related work. So we introduce a new algorithm for online SSP, which we call EBSSP, for exploration bonus for stochastic shortest path. It's the first algorithm to achieve the minimax regret rate of V star square root of SAK, while simultaneously being parameter free. And it's also the first algorithm to achieve horizon free regret in various cases, such as positive costs, as well as general costs when an order accurate estimate of T star is available. So now let's position these results with respect to the related work. So uh, the setting of online SSP was first studied in our paper last year, where we achieved a regret bound scaling as square root of K divided by C min, when C min is a lower bound on all the costs that is strictly positive, or in the case of general non-negative costs, the dependency goes to K to the two thirds. Then Rosenberg et al. improved the regret bound and achieved the first order optimal square root of K regret bound. So note that these two approaches are model optimistic. That is to say they leverage IDEA based on the UCRL2 algorithm in average world MDPs. So here there was still a gap with respect to the lower bound and it was recently and concurrently closed by Cohen et al. So this paper was recently presented by Aviv Rosenberg earlier this month at, uh, here at the seminar and uh, they achieved a B star square root of SAK minimax regret bound. So their approach is based on a black box reduction of SSP to finite horizon. And it requires the parameters B star and in particular the parameters T star for the algorithm. And also we note that the lower order terms that, uh, that are here, and it's the case for all existing regret bounds, depend polynomially on T star, which may be problematic if T star is very large. So in this work, we propose a different approach uh, to tackle online SSP, which is that we fully embrace the non-truncated SSP nature and we uh, uh, apply a value optimistic approach. So when we know the B star and T star parameters, we achieve a minimax rate of B star square root of SAK plus a lower order term B star S squared A that is horizon free because it doesn't depend polynomially on T star. So this is very advantageous when T star grows very large. And in fact, we can see that it's the first horizon free regret bounds beyond the finite horizon setting. And moving uh, down the spectrum of trying to be fully parameter free, we can see that uh, we are still able to achieve a minimax rate of B star square root of SAK while uh, not requiring knowledge of B star and T star. So here we see that in this regret bound, there is an additive term that scales with T star divided by a polynomial quantity in the number of episodes K. So this means that the regret here is not strictly speaking horizon free. However, we may dub it as horizon vanishing in the sense that when the number of episodes K is very large, this fraction becomes uh, negligible. So we can also mention some additional related work on online SSP. There's the direction of studying SSP with adversarially changing costs as well as the direction of studying the sample complexity of SSP with a generative model. Here, what's kind of interesting with the SSP setting is that regret guarantees do not directly imply sample complexity bounds, which is different, for example, from finite horizon MDPs. And there's also been the investigation of exploration problems that involve multiple goal states, uh, which may be labeled as multi-goal SSP or uh, goal-conditioned RL. And following our preprint and archive uh, back in April, there's been some subsequent work on online SSP. So uh, there's been the first study of SSP regret beyond tabular, specifically with linear function approximation by Vial et al. There's also been the study of SSP with posterior sampling by Jafarnia Jaromi et al. And of particular interest, uh, very recently, no more than a couple of weeks ago, Sean et al introduced a generic template for regret minimization in SSP. So they instantiate their template with a model-based algorithm, and it exactly matches our regret bound. And also their algorithm can be made fully parameter-free with the scheme that I'm going to introduce later. And second, they also interestingly uh, instantiate it with a model-free algorithm, which is the first of its kind in online SSP, and it's able to achieve a minimax regret rate under the assumption of positive costs. And finally, we can note that Chen et al these algorithms perform one-step planning instead of full planning, and so they are able to have sparse computational updates. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, dig into a bit more detail in our algorithm EBSSP. So what are the key ingredients? 
So it's a model-based algorithm, and it's based on a value-optimistic approach on the non-truncated SSP problem. What it does is that it carefully skews the empirical transitions as well as perturbs the empirical costs with an exploration bonus. And this is going to induce an optimistic SSP problem whose associated value iteration scheme is guaranteed to converge. And interestingly, the algorithm doesn't need to know T star, and it's also able to handle unknown B star by using an adaptive scheme with an adaptive proxy B that I'm going to introduce later on. So at a high level, what the algorithm does is that it initializes Q values for each state action pair at zero, and it sequentially selects the action AT that minimizes the Q value at the current state ST. And once in a while, the agent is going to perform planning and compute new Q values for each state action pair. So here, the trigger condition that we consider is the standard doubling condition introduced by Jack Chital. That is to say, we replan whenever the visit of a state action pair doubles. And the main algorithmic component lies into how we compute the new Q values. And to do so, we introduce a new procedure called VSGO, standing for value iteration with slight goal optimism. So how does the VSGO planning procedure work? So it takes as input a precision level, epsilon VI, assumed to be strictly positive, and it starts with optimistic values initialized at zero. And here the structure is very similar to standard value iteration tailored for SSP. So while two consecutive iterates have an L-infinity distance that is larger than epsilon VI, then the agent iteratively computes a new iterate VI plus one, which is the application of a Bellman operator L tilde on the current iterate VI. And it simply outputs the values VI plus one and associated Q values QI plus one. So now right here, the main question is how do we define our operator L tilde on which we iterate? So uh, at a given planning phase, the agent computes the empirical transitions P hat, as well as the empirical costs C hat, and the visit counters NSA. So what the algorithm is going to do is that it's going to perform a slight goal skewing on the empirical transitions. So it's going to define transitions P tilde that are exactly the same as the empirical transitions P hat, to the exception that it's going to artificially add a non-zero probability of reaching the goal from any state action pair. And here we see that this weight that is added uh, scales inversely with the number of visits to the current state action pair SA so far. So here, let's take a step back and observe that we have three uh, transition models uh, currently. We have the true transition model P, which is unknown. And we know that by assumption, it admits at least one proper policy. That is to say, one, prop one policy that reaches the goal with probability one. In the empirical transition model P hat, interestingly, there may not be any proper policy. And so naively running value iteration on such a model may diverge. And thanks to our slight goal skewing, we are able to ensure that actually all policies are proper in the P tilde transitions. So now we can define our bonus function. So here I'm not going to go in the detail of the full expression, but what we can see is that it's a variance aware bonus, where here we have the variance with respect to the P tilde transitions of the input vector V. Um, we also have a proxy here B which captures the range of the optimal value function and recall that it's unknown. So we're going to have to explain later how we handle such a proxy. So here, these two terms correspond uh, basically to a Bernstein upper bound on concentration inequalities. The C3 term corresponds to uh, the error in estimation of the cost function. And the last term weight, weighted by C4 uh, corresponds to the bias introduced by the slight goal skewing with the P tilde transitions with respect to P hat. And given our transitions P tilde and our bonus function, we are ready to define our operator L tilde. So it takes as input a vector V and a state S, and it simply outputs the minimum over actions of the empirical cost C hat of SA plus the inner product of the P tilde transitions times the V vector minus the bonus function. And this is truncated at zero to ensure that the output is always non-negative. So here we see that the operator is injecting two sources of optimism. One, it's thanks to the slight goal skewing with the transitions P tilde. And the other one, it's thanks to the bonus function that intuitively is lowering the costs. 
Okay, so now I'm going to give a brief overview of the analysis. So uh, we're going to uh, rely on an intermediate regret bound in order to uh, derive all our future final regret bounds. And it requires the following conditions. So first, we assume that the proxy B is well-tuned, so that it's larger than B star. That is to say, we, we assume for now that we have some prior knowledge on B star. And also, we assume for now, for simplicity, that B star is larger than 1, although our algorithm can easily handle the case of B star strictly smaller than 1. And also, we assume a quite technical condition, which is that the value function of any improper policy has at least one unbounded component. So what this technical uh, condition guarantees is that the optimal policy is proper and satisfies the Bellman optimality equations, which is going to be useful in the analysis. And so given this set of conditions, we can prove that with high probability, the regret is bounded as follows. So B star square root of SAK times the log term that scales with TK, which is the accumulated time over the K episodes, plus a lower order term here that depends on our proxy B. So this intermediate regret bound has some caveats. For example, it depends on TK, which is a, a random quantity and possibly unbounded. And it also requires the second condition too, which is possibly restricted. But for now, I'm going to explain how the proof works. And then I'm going to uh, go in more detail how we can uh, derive our final regret bounds with this result as an intermediate result. So first in the proof, we're going to establish some important properties of the Visgo planning procedure. So what we can show is that as long as a proxy is not smaller than B star, then we have optimism, which is that the Q values computed by Visgo are always smaller or equal than the optimal Q values for any state action pair. And also we have finite time near convergence, which is that the Visgo planning procedure always terminates within a finite and polynomially bounded number of iteration steps. So how do we prove this? So to prove optimism, we're going to derive a monotonicity property for the L tilde operator. And this can be achieved by carefully tuning the constants in the bonus. And so here we see that this is a similar argument than what is used in the analysis of the MVP algorithm of Zong et al in finite horizon MVPs. On the other hand, the second requirement of convergence is SSP specific. Indeed, in finite horizon MDPs, we can do planning simply by performing H backward induction steps, which is no longer the case in SSP. And to guarantee that we have convergence, we derive a contraction property for the L tilde operator. And we show this with the same choice of constants C1, C2, C3, C4. So we can show that we have a contraction modulus that is strictly smaller than one. And the reason for that is that here, this term nu is strictly bigger than zero. So nu denotes um, the probability from any state action pair of transitioning to the goal according to the tr transitions P tilde. And recall that by construction of the P tilde slightly goal skewed transitions, we are ensured that this is strictly bigger than zero and it allows us to derive our contraction property. So now let's, let me give a very high level overview of the way the regret decomposition works. But first I'm gonna introduce a bit of notation. So recall that for now, we still consider that the proxy B is an overestimate of B star, so that we have our two Visgo properties of optimism and convergence that hold. And uh, we denote by VT the Visgo value at the current time step T. And also we define normalized value VT bar, which is simply VT divided by B star. And so this is normalized, so we're ensured by optimism that this lies in the interval 0, 1. And also we're going to importantly define CK as the cumulative cost over the K episodes and TK as the cumulative time over the K episodes. And so recall once again that these two quantities are um, random variables and possibly unbounded too. And so now I'm going to try to give a high level idea of the regret decomposition in one slide. So um, recall that the regret in SSP is exactly the cumulative cost incurred by the agent minus a translation term, which is k times v pi star at the initial state. So now we bound the Bellman error successively, and we use the optimism property of Visgo, as well as the fact that the vt value approximates the fixed point of L tilde. And so roughly what we can obtain is that the regret is bounded by the sum over time of the bonuses plus some additional terms.
Now we use our bonus expression, and roughly we can bound the regret as the sum over the time steps of this variance aware quantity, which is the sum, the square root of the variance of the VT value with respect to P tilde divided by the current state action counts NT. And then we simply here in these steps replace the P tilde occurrence in the variance with the true transitions P. And to do so, we can simply leverage the relation between P tilde, P hat, and the true transitions P. So now here we're going to split this variance using a standard Pinger-Hill principle. And so we're going to have square root of SA times square root of the sum over the time steps of the variance of the VT value with respect to the true transitions P. And now we're going to perform the important step of normalizing the value. So here we have an extra multiplicative factor B star because we consider the normalized value inside the variance, which importantly lies in the interval 0, 1. And now we're going to apply the law of total variance once. So what we're going to make appear is the sum over the time steps of the variance of a second higher of a second moment of the VT vector, a V bar T vector, sorry. And importantly, the extra terms that are going to appear in the analysis can be related to the cumulative costs incurred by the agent. And we apply that recursively uh, following similar uh, inspired, let's say, from the way it's handled in finite horizon MDPs, where also the sum of the variances are bounded in a recursive fashion. And we can expand up to a higher order moment. And roughly after some simplifications, we can get the following regret bound, which is square root of B star SA times the cumulative cost times log of TK. So here, this is not fully satisfactory because we have the CK upper bound, which is a random quantity, and it's it's hard to bound per se. However, and this is where the, let's say, magic of SSP lies, is that the regret is exactly defined as the cumulative cost minus a translation term. And so what we see is that we have a quadratic inequality that pops up in the cumulative cost. And so we can simply solve it and plug it back into the regret. And ultimately, we can replace the dependence on the cumulative cost by the dependence on the number of episodes k. And ultimately, we can obtain the sought after regret bound of B star square root of SAK times log of TK. So here, let's try to make a connection with what happens under the hood in finite horizon MDPs, because they also apply some similar uh, recursion tricks. So in finite horizon MDPs, when the recursion uh, is applied on the variance, the extra terms that pop up is the cumulative regret, uh, sorry, the cumulative reward across learning. And so the way this is handled is that thanks to the assumption of a total bounded reward by one, it's simply bounded by a capital K. So the cumulative reward is bounded by capital K thanks to this assumption. In SSP, when we do the recursions, we have the cumulative costs that appear as extra terms. And interestingly, we can directly eliminate this without any extra assumption, by, but simply by solving a quadratic inequality in the cumulative cost, as I mentioned. And so here, what we can see is that uh, thanks to a fundamental property of SSP and the regret, the way regret is defined in SSP, we're able to achieve Minimax horizon-free regret without needing to have an extra assumption. So, um, so this ultimately enables us to prove our intermediate regret bound. So uh, let me recall it here. We have B stars root of SAK. So this is the minimax rate times a log term depending on the cumulative time plus a lower order term that depends on our proxy B. So here we see that there are a few caveats with this intermediate regret bound. First, it relies on the second condition here, which may be possibly restrictive. And also, more importantly, it depends on TK, albeit in a log term, but still it depends on TK, which is a random quantity and possibly unbounded. So the way we handle both condition two and the dependence on TK is by performing a cost perturbation trick. And so similar to what prior work has done in online SSP, we will apply the analysis and run the algorithm in a cost perturbed MDP, where what we're going to do is simply lower bound the costs to ensure that they are always lower bounded by a positive constant eta. And the important uh, statement is that if costs are lower bounded by a positive constant eta, then first of all, the second condition always holds. 
And second, the cumulative time can be upper bounded by the cumulative cost divided by the minimum perturbation eta. And so the way we're going to bound the cumulative cost is by applying a circular argument similar to what has been explained before. So by leveraging the appearance of a cumulative cost in the regret definition. So note that the true regret is basically roughly upper bounded by the regret in the cost perturbed MDP plus a bias that scales with the minimum cost perturbation eta times T star K. And now what there remains to do is to tune the cost perturbation. And so we're going to tune it so that this is going to be appropriately bounded. So specifically, if we don't have any prior knowledge, we're going to tune the cost perturbation so that it's equal to the inverse of a polynomial quantity in K. So that here, this becomes a constant term that depends additively in T star. So that's why we had T star divided by a polynomial quantity in K as an additive term. However, if we have some loose prior knowledge on T star, then we can leverage it to tune the cost perturbation. And specifically, by setting a cost perturbation equal as one divided by this loose prior knowledge times a polynomial quantity in T star, then we can ensure that the bias here is only constant and importantly, doesn't depend polynomially on T star. And this is what enables us to achieve a horizon-free regret guarantee. Uh, and the second aspect is that, uh, recall that we have a first condition, which is that we need the proxy B to be properly tuned. And so to do that, we're going to introduce a parameter-free scheme that is going to adaptively tune the B proxy. And so this is the last part here. So um, first, let's take a step back and try to see what it means not knowing the B star quantity. So uh, having an unknown B star means that we do not know the range of the optimal value function. And so uh, the thing is, is that an expiration bonus method requires some sort of bound on B star, so the optimal value function starting from any state. So this is not a challenge in existing settings, where the bound that is used on the optimal value function is simply an upper bound on the value of any policy, which is either H in finite horizon MDPs, or one in finite horizon MDPs with bounded total reward, or one over one minus gamma in the discounted case. However, in SSP, a priori, we may not know any suitable bound on the optimal value function. And what's uh, important is that if we have an underestimate B of B star, then the analysis that I mentioned before may totally break. And in particular, the conditions of optimism and convergence may not hold in our planning procedure visco. And finally, we can mention that it may be completely impossible to estimate the B star uh, parameter online. Why this is the case? Well, because in SSP, some states may not be reachable. And so the agent, for example, may not visit uh, some states at all in the learning process. And so it will be impossible for the agent to accurately have an estimate of uh, the value function of the optimal policy starting from any state. OK, so um, how does our parameter free scheme work? So at a high level, it starts with a proxy B that we set equal to one. And what uh, the scheme is going to do is simply constantly increase the proxy B in a consistent way so that at some point it's going to become a valid overestimate of B star. So it means that we're going to split the time steps in two regimes. In the first regime, we're going to have our proxy B, that is an underestimate of B star. And in the second regime, we're going to have an overestimate of B star. So this may suggest that we could apply a standard doubling trick. However, it's unclear how this, how this would pan out. And indeed, we can see that if we have an underestimate B, then there is the risk of not managing to reach the goal in the current episode and therefore getting stuck in the current episode forever. So we see that we cannot simply wait for the end of the episode to increase our proxy B. And also, quite importantly, we see that here the pivot time between the two regimes is unknown because by construction, B star is unknown. And actually, it's quite unclear how the algorithm would be able to track the doubling trick procedure and basically decide whether it should stop it or not. 
And so this is why, and this is quite important, that we perform a distinction between two regimes, but this is only done implicitly. That is to say, only at the level of the analysis, because the algorithm will not know in which regime it is. So uh, how do, at the analysis, how are we going to bound the regret in each regime? So in the second regime, since we have a valid overestimate of B star, we can simply apply the intermediate result that I mentioned before. So the regret is upper bounded by B star square root of SAK plus a lower order term that depends on the overestimate B. However, a question is how do we bound the regret in the first regime where we have an underestimate? And so what we're going to do is use the definition of regret in SSP and simply say that the regret in the first regime is upper bounded by the cumulative cost incurred in the first regime. And now the remaining question is, how do we bound the cumulative cost in the first regime? So now I'm going to explain in more detail how we gradually increment our proxy B over time. So we're going to increment it with two different ways. The first one is going to be an inter-episode increment. So that's quite simple. Whenever we start a new episode K, we simply automatically increase the proxy B and make it scale with a function in square root of K. So here, the simple observation is that for large enough K, we are sure that at some point we're going to reach the second regime. However, it's not enough just to have this type of increment, because as I mentioned before, there's a risk of getting stuck in an episode in the first regime. Because if in the first regime we have an underestimate, then the agent may deploy non-proper policies, and therefore it may not be able to reach the goal and terminate the episode. And this is why we need a second type of increment, which is going to work at the level of within each episode. So specifically, we're going to have two types of intra-episode increment. The first one is that we're going to track the range of each VSGO planning iterate. And as soon as it exceeds the current proxy B, then it means that there's an issue somewhere in the planning process. And so we simply double the estimate B. So that's quite simple. The second uh, increment is that we're going to track the cumulative cost over time. And specifically, we're going to define uh, um, a cost threshold fee, which is fully computable with uh, current quantities, so that the current proxy, the current episode index, and so on. And whenever the cumulative cost exceeds this threshold, we're going to automatically double the B proxy. And so now here with this type of increment, we can see the way we're going to bound the regrets in the first regime. Because the regret, as I mentioned, is upper bounded by the cumulative costs. And here, the cumulative costs are simply upper bounded by the number of times this cost threshold is violated times the cost threshold itself. And so what we can show is by carefully tuning the cost threshold, we're going to be able to have an adequate bound on the cumulative cost. And then we're going to be able to bound the regrets in both regimes uh, simultaneously. And ultimately, we're going to obtain the following guarantee for a parameter-free algorithm. So let RK star bound the regrets of EBSSP when we know B star. So the regret when we don't know B star is simply RK star times a logarithmic term that scales with uh, the, the, the total time step plus a lower order term that importantly doesn't depend polynomially on T star. So we can see that we're able to circumvent the knowledge of B star up to an extra log term and lower order horizon free terms. And here what's important to mention is that at an algorithmic level, we're only with respect to the case where we know B star, we are only performing a dual tracking of the cumulative costs and the planning iterates, and also performing a careful increment of our proxy in the bonus. But that's it. So what we can see is that uh, there is no fundamental modification in the structure of our algorithm between unknown B star and known B star. So uh, now uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up and uh, give a bit of outlook uh, here. So uh, first, as a quick summary, uh, I've presented EBSSP, which is the first algorithm in online SSP to achieve a minimax rate of B star square root of SAK, while simultaneously being fully parameter free. And also it can achieve horizon free regrets in various cases, such as positive costs 
or general cost when an order accurate estimate of T star is available. So in some sense, our regret bound is able to withstand the test of the time to go. So future directions that we can mention are, so first of all, uh, an obvious and interesting open question is whether it's possible to simultaneously achieve minimax, parameter-free, and horizon-free regret in the general cost case. Uh, a second direction could be to try to derive tighter sample complexity bounds for SSP. And in particular here, a promising direction could be to leverage our planning procedure VSCO. And also, if you would have asked me uh, a couple of weeks ago, I would have said that the natural direction would be to study SSP beyond tabular and beyond model-based. And interestingly, this would, uh, so a first step was done by Vialeta, which studied SSP with linear function approximation, as well as Chenetal, which introduced the first model-free algorithm for SSP. So now uh, maybe I can wrap up by um, wondering whether there's any insight or discussion that we can learn from studying SSP uh, in a theoretical sense. So what we can note is that in DeepRL, there are actually many tasks that are goal conditioned. So this is a, a setting that appears a lot in DeepRL applications. And the way existing algorithms in DeepRL solve them is that they have a known horizon H and the agent resets every H time steps. So algorithmically, the agent is reducing the goal-oriented problem to an episodic finite horizon NDP. However, this approach algorithmically relies on carefully tuning the horizon H. And this is a very sensitive hyperparameter in DeepRL. And in fact, it should be a tight upper bound on the task horizon. It shouldn't be too small, otherwise we may introduce a bias and we may never be able to, to solve the task and reach the goal. But if it's too large, then it means we may waste a lot of samples. And here, what our theoretical investigation of goal-oriented RL is revealing is that, at least from a regret minimization tabular perspective, it's not harder to tackle an RL task that has a random, unknown, and possibly unbounded horizon, in the sense that we are able to be uh, minimax parameter-free and also horizon free in various cases, such as the positive cost case, which is almost always verified in deep RL applications. So this observation is kind of promising in the sense that it may suggest that it perhaps could be possible to design smarter algorithms in deep RL that are able to circumvent this prior knowledge of the task horizon and to avoid a finite horizon reduction. So for example, a promising direction could be to try to learn when to reset of a deep RL agent via a curriculum of increasing episode lengths that would be able to adapt to the unknown task horizon. And that's it for my talk. Thanks a lot for, for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I do have a question. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I go first and then. Yeah, yeah. Also think about questions. Uh, so very interesting integral part of the algorithm is uh, estimating B star. Uh, yeah, yeah. The thing that is not entirely clear to me, why the algorithm cannot overestimate B star, like go over B star by a greater amount uh, because initially the policies are not that great, right? Yes, exactly. So, um, so okay. So uh, as you're mentioning, especially when we look at the regret bound, when we have an overestimate, we see that the proxy here is only a lower order term. So as you're saying, it gives us quite a bit of slack to uh, have a quite large overestimate. And in fact, that's what we're doing. So we are never stopping to increment B because whenever we start an episode, we make it scale with square root of K where K is the episode index. So ultimately what we're gonna obtain is here a square root of K uh, dependency, uh, mm -hmm. which is going to be subsumed by the final regret bound. But uh, as you're mentioning, we are actually uh, overestimating by a large margin B star. And okay. the reason why we do this is that we don't have a clear understanding 
when we'd be able to identify that we are in the second regime. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I have a question, more general question about B star, and uh, yes. this is just due to my ignorance of this setting. Uh, so this lower bound, which depends on B star, do you know, like, if, if so I know it's a worst case lower bound. So is yes. it, is B star the only way to characterize the dependence in that example, or could it be something like from max over S, min over pi? Yeah, so that's a uh, that's a great question. So, so you're totally right that the the lower bound, which makes B star appear in the, in the leading term, is worst case, and so it there is the maximum over states. So here it's really the infinity norm. So as you're uh, suggesting, maybe it would be possible to have a more refined bound, and for example, to only make appear the states visited so far by the algorithm, and to try to weight them by let's say the probability of visiting. Uh, and I would assume that possibly problem dependent bounds would be able to capture that. But right now it's a, it's an open question in SSP. So the only existing bounds, both upper bounds and lower bounds are a uh, problem independent and worst case. But I think it's a, uh, it's an interesting direction to, to try to, but even to have in problem problem independent independent, I don't know how, if that example admits it, but even with problem independent, like, like you could have a quantity, like the way we have diameter in, in the. Yeah. You're getting where it's max over s, but it's also like for every s there is a min over pi. So this is like for pi star being used in any s, right? Ah, okay, okay, I see. So you you, you mean the um, the fastest policy, right? For that to, state, uh, because the same policy. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe the lower bound already refutes that, but I I don't know if it does or not. Okay, uh, okay. So so what you're okay, I see. So what you're saying is maybe have a dependence on the diameter where you would constrain the last state to be just the goal state. So this uh, this is uh, actually so this is what we call the SSP diameter. So it's really the same as the diameter the diameter in communicating MDPs, except that the second state in the pair of states has to be the goal state. But what we have is that B star is always a lower bound on this diameter. So uh, actually, it would be looser to uh, consider the SSP diameter. And this is because the costs are between 0 and 1. Oh, maybe. maybe. No, all I meant in replace, yeah. replace pi star by min on a starting state dependent policy. Maybe I'm right, not, but, 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 not uh, a so, single right. pi star. Okay, oh, you're so, saying okay. because it's but, the, but the thing is exactly right. so so this yeah. this is a cost weighted sure, quantity sure, sure. Sorry. and what you're mentioning is a time weighted right. quantity which would necessarily be larger this is because costs are between zero and one but that's a great question and in fact in uh, in our first uh, paper in uh, in online ssp uh, here we had this ssp diameter that you're mentioning in our bound but it turns out as rosenberg et al showed that it's actually much tighter to have the cost weighted bound Not ask a question. Sure. sure. Daniel, yeah, I are you with us, or, or do you wanna yeah. do you want us to ask the question? Them. Them. Meaning it wasn't exactly clear. Oh, you can like yeah, here. Uh, you can just like ask your question. Okay, so the uh, it was not entirely clear if the algorithm was fully solving the plan at at each step using the optimistic operator, or it was mm -hmm. just doing one application of the optimistic operator to just do a partial improvement of the value function. Uh, so you mean really in the planning phase, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, right now the way it's uh, it's done is uh, is uh, full planning. So we basically okay. 
yeah so we uh so uh, what we do is whenever there's a trigger condition we update uh, the value function for each state action pair so this is often called full planning uh, so what you're maybe suggesting is to have more uh, sparser and online planning where we would have uh, basically one step planning and uh, this was actually uh, proposed uh, in uh, so i think in finite horizon mdps by a paper by efroni et al uh, a few years ago and uh, and recently chen et al in on an ssp uh, proposed to have uh, a more one step uh, planning approach which of course lowers the, the computational complexity yeah, because here essentially, if you if you do full planning, it's not a problem because you're starting from zero or from something like reasonable. Exactly. Yeah. But if you're doing partial planning and then you increase your B, then you might be in a very wrong model compared to your uh, new B. And I don't know if you can still prove convergence or how it would work. Right, right. No, that's a great question. So it's true that at least uh, in the in the full planning, so the way we consider it, so basically it's really doing value iteration tailored for SSP. And as you're saying, the critical part is to start with an optimistic value. So always initialize at zero. And intuitively, as you're saying, it's going to increase over. And here, what's quite important is that, so when we know B star, we are sure that always the iterates are going to be upper bounded by B star. And this is really by optimism. However, if we have a proxy B, the risk, of course, is that this planning procedure may break and we may at some point have an iterate that is strictly larger than the current estimate B. And in that case, what we do is, as I was mentioning in the uh, unknown B star case, we have this intra episode increment where we track each uh, planning iterate and whenever it exceeds the current proxy, we have to double it. But, um, but it's true that we have to be very careful in the planning phase when we don't have, uh, when basically we have a wrong proxy and so the policy that we may compute uh, can be very, uh, very bad. But and then so the planning may go wrong. After you double, you, re you replan from scratch. Essentially. Exactly. We replan from scratch with this uh, updated okay. B. Yeah. And you, so you, of course, you didn't yeah. look into what happens if you keep the previous partial plan and you just try to update that, for example. No, no. But I think it would be uh, possibly a, an interesting direction. So yeah, what we do is whenever we have this uh, basically... Uh, a threshold that is violated, we uh, update the B and we replan directly. So here the, the computational overhead is extremely limited because what we can prove is that this is going to happen only a logarithmic amount of times. Why? Because since we do a doubling of B, we're sure that after basically log B star times, uh, we are going to be over B star. So this doesn't happen a lot. But uh, you're right that maybe it, it could be possible to try to avoid having full planning uh, right after again. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I have a very different question. Um, have, have you thought about uh, min max games and uh, zero sum min max games? Like, uh, th there also there is an end, right? Like, uh, there's a goal, like, there are two players, you want to solve this. Maybe you have mm -hmm. some generative model, and uh, it, it is somehow like the stochastic shortest path, but it's not in many ways. So, you're, so, you're, so, you're, so, I'm, so I'm not I'm, at all familiar I'm, with this uh, literature. But if you're saying that there's a connection, then uh, then it's interesting, and I'll have to, to check it out. But I, I'm not familiar with it at all. It's kind of like you want to win fast if you have a chance to win, and otherwise you don't even want to get fast to the goal, so it, it's a more complicated scenario. OK, right. but there is this kind of trade-off uh, also between uh, but, but otherwise trying there to is, end yeah, the, the game fine. fast and also trying to optimize performance well. Yeah, yeah, I see. Mm. Yeah, so there may be a connection, yeah. But I haven't uh, thought about it. OK. So just to understand the algorithm a bit better. Um, yeah. yeah um, so can you show your 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 value like the the term that you use the the modification to the element operator? Yes. Uh, so the this slide or, or the next yeah, slide? Yeah. This slide, okay. So, 
So there is like a, yeah, this is more general question. So sometimes there is a need to use this uh, model P explicitly. And sometimes like mm -hmm. there is the work on optimistic Q learning, which doesn't use explicit um, explicit uh, estimates of yes. P. Can you like, is, is, this, uh, is this specific to the shortest path or do you think this is just a choice of? Okay, yeah. So, so uh, as you're saying here, we're we're fully uh, model based in the sense that we have a, a, an estimate p. Uh, so of course we cannot use. Uh, so if we had access to the true p, we would use the true p. Here we cannot use the the empirical p hat as in uh, existing settings, because as I mentioned, doing that may diverge, and so we have our slight goal skewing uh, p tilde. Then of course there's another. Uh, possibility, which would, would, would to, to go fully model free, and so mm -hmm. not to maintain an estimate, and to basically update Q online, and mm -hmm. this is this is possible, and it was recently achieved by uh, by a paper that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago by Chen et al. So they they have um, a model free regret bound, and the the early works, let's say in planning by Bersexas in the 90s, they also showed uh, and studied the let's say the convergence of um, of um, of, uh, of planning in a model-free sense. So, uh, so Q learning does converge for SSP and, uh, and this has been shown uh, for, for quite a long time. So I would say there's no fundamental difficulty of being model-free, uh, of course, excluding the technical details of the analysis. So one thing that I maybe can point out is that the main, I would say, challenge from a regret point of view of going model-free is, uh, is here the lower order terms. So uh, it's well known that current, at least in model uh, free algorithms in, in finite horizon, often the dependencies in the horizon is very large. So it's at least H to the four. And this becomes very problematic in SSP because this H dependency is actually uh, B star divided by C min. And if we have a very bad dependency on C min, so let's say a lower order dependency that scales in one over C min to the four, but it's really a low order dependency. Then this actually, when we translate to the general cost case by doing a cost perturbation, this worsens the regret. And so we go from square root of K to uh, K to the four fifth. So I would say this is the main issue that is not SSP specific, but more general across regret minimization settings is that current model free analyses, they have uh, a quite large dependence on the horizon for the lower order terms. And while in finite horizon, it's not an issue, it actually becomes an issue in SSP when we go from positive costs to uh, general non-negative costs. It, it will translate into dependence, high dependence on B star or on K? I, I would think- On K, on, on K. K, yeah. So that's what's uh, quite peculiar. So let's say, so if if you have a lower order dependency that is, so let's say in, in the case of positive costs, you have the regret, which is square root of K plus one over C min to the four, but this is really an additive term. So it doesn't depend on anything else. Then when we do the cost perturbation trick, the issue is that this term is gonna predominate and it leads to a K to the four fifth regret bound. And so that's why uh, the, basically in SSP algorithms are extremely sensitive to the horizon, uh, which uh, basically is not cost based. So it's a bit related to our discussion between having a time based quantity and a cost based quantity. What we want to appear is, is B star quantities. So it's really the, the B star, uh, so sorry, it's, uh, it's here the way it's defined. So what we want to have is really to have a cost-driven quantity. As soon as we have a time-driven quantity, which is the notion of horizon in finite horizon MDPs, then this may be very bad for, uh, for SSP. Um, so that's where, let's say, the, the current uh, hurdle comes from in having a minimax uh, bounds in model-free algorithms for SSP. It's really when, when it's going from positive cost to general cost with a cost perturbation trick. So of course, this raises another interesting question, which is, is there a smarter way to deal with the analysis rather than first studying positive costs and then doing the cost perturbation trick? And maybe there is, but right now I would say it's uh, most algorithms apply, uh, apply this, uh, this, uh, this, like divide the analysis in two. But maybe there's a smarter way of, uh, of not dealing with the first positive costs and then uh, the cost perturbation. 
because yeah, the big issue with the cost perturbation is that it, is, it introduces lots of extra biases, such as this one, for example. And it's super hard to accurately tune the cost perturbation. Uh, yeah. So can you explain the condition too? Sorry. Yes. The question. I, I, I didn't completely get that. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, so the condition two is, um, okay, maybe let me take a step back. So in, in SSP, uh, we are not sure that there, let's say the SSP problem is well posed. And to do that, you need to have two, let's say the two most simple conditions are that there exists at least one proper policy and that all costs are strictly positive. And then in that case, we are sure that we have uh, basically the optimal policies proper and it satisfies some, uh, some Bellman optimality equations. So these are, let's say, the two easiest conditions to have at least one proper uh, policy, which is the basic assumption, and to have costs that are strictly positive. And so a way to relax this strictly positive cost assumption is to say that for any policy that doesn't reach the goal, we are sure that the, its value function is going to have one unbounded component. So that is to say, it's going to keep on incurring strictly positive costs. So for example, this condition doesn't hold if you have a self loop at a state with cost zero, because then you could always keep that, you know, do that self loop forever. The value function would not grow because you wouldn't suffer any positive costs. But the issue is that you would never reach the goal. And so, uh, it's quite a pathological scenario of having, let's say, self loops with zero cost, but it can happen. And so the way uh, we deal with it in the analysis is that we assume this condition, which then ensures that everything is valid. So we have optimality Bellman equations and let's say the two objectives of reaching the goal and minimizing the value function, they kind of coincide. And then the way we remove this assumption is by simply doing the cost perturbation trick that we applied. And so, in the cost perturbed model, we are sure that all costs are strictly positive. And so that basically, if we have a policy that doesn't reach the goal, then it's going to incur infinite costs. So that's the, that's the idea behind, uh, behind this, uh, this technical condition that, that we assume. And that's required because that will help you in eliminating that policy, like. Ah, so, so you're asking why do we need yeah. this condition to prove yeah. it? Yeah, so, so actually, the, yeah, that's an interesting question because it doesn't appear explicitly in the algorithm. Uh, it actually appears hidden in the way that we need to do the regret decomposition to have the Bellman optimality equations. And so we need to be sure that basically the, the optimal policy is proper and it satisfies the Bellman optimality equations in Q star. And this is needed for any type of regret uh, analysis in finite horizon, et cetera. And we need to have basically these Bellman optimality equations that pop up in the regret decomposition. And to do that, we need to have this condition. Because otherwise, uh, we may not have, uh, we may not be able to play with the Bellman equations. So it's done, it's really at the level of the analysis that we need this. But it's kind of hidden in the algorithm. That's why it's a bit confusing, uh, I, I agree. So, so maybe just, just to give yeah. you an additional intuition, uh, is also related to the fact of uh, doing planning in the sense that uh, it's also a question then to what solution will converge the, the planning, for instance, through the iteration. Because then, uh, the, 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 I mean, if you have an improper policy, maybe a degenerate solution. And so you, so you want VPI, VPI to be well-defined for every... Exactly. Yeah. And, this, and this is because of the way we define regret is by targeting uh, the, um, the optimal proper policy. Uh, and so we really want the, the algorithm to minimize the value function, but under the constraint that it reaches the goal with probability one. So that's why we really target the optimal proper policy here. We don't just want to minimize costs. We want to minimize costs and also be sure that we reach the goal. By introducing this bias towards the goal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you are I mean, like uh, for, for the planning, like the, the MDP that is used in planning, this is yes, completely yes. circumvented, right? So policies are proper, as, as you also noted. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Right, so so it's 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 clearly just an analysis thing that is happening here. Although the policy that you may end up is maybe an improper policy, but like you will detect that, right? And then you increase the B and things change. Exactly. exactly. The idea is it's going to be uh, proper in uh, in this optimistic model. So when we do planning, we're safe. Because planning in SSP, you know, as we were mentioning, we may have degenerate solutions. So at least we're safe with planning. And then, of course, the main question is, in the true model, it may not be proper. So we may never reach the goal. And as you're saying, the check that we have is by if the cumulative cost becomes large enough, then basically there's an issue somewhere. And so we replan and we, we double uh, basically our estimate. And this is really because, and that's that's I would say that's the main takeaway message is that uh, we can do all this because of the way regret is defined, which is really exhibiting the cumulative cost. And so that's why uh, our way of observing that there's an issue going on is by using our upper bound on the regret in the case where everything is going well and basically mapping it with what the algorithm is actually doing in practice. And this is something that we cannot do, for example, in finite horizon MDPs, because here there's a sum of uh, value functions, which would be harder to uh, to to estimate. Okay, that that was my question of like because you you're saying this as if this was the unusual case, but in a way this should be the usual case that you just like sum up your rewards or costs, whatnot, and you compare it to the optimal and like. On one part, when in the competition part, of course you can take expectations. Who cares? Mm. Um, uh, but but it is actually your cause that matters. Uh, and so I wanted to ask, like, what, what, what? Why are you emphasizing this as if? But okay, I I see because a lot of people are using the pseudo reward, but that was like an approximation exactly. to mm. the to the actual the pseudo regret. That was an approximation to simplify things, to reduce some uh, variance effects that you are not mm -hmm. super interested in. But but here, uh, this is a bit different, I guess. So so just to clarify, if I just set cost to be one for every step, and yeah. I make the value function that way, will this this condition would be naturally satisfied, right? For any policy that doesn't reach the goal. Exactly. Yeah, because costs are strictly positive. And in that case, we have that uh, B star and T star are exactly the same. same. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the cost dimension and the time dimension are going to align perfectly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but the, for me, that's the most natural, I don't know, <laughs> so I think to think no, of sure, sure. Ah, you mean to have, uh, to have cost uh, sensitive? Uh... No, I agree. I agree. And what's actually kind of interesting and what we showed in our in our first paper is that when costs are equal to to one? So as you're saying, all costs are equal to one. Then actually, you don't need you don't need any SSP machinery to solve that. You can just solve an average reward problem where you put the reward at one at the goal state and zero everywhere else. And so you you have a quite nice solution by just deploying UCRL two with this reward where you know instead of having costs one everywhere and zero at the goal, you kind of flip it around. So I would say that average reward techniques can handle the case where all costs are equal. And it's uh, so in terms of applications, it's a good question. I would say that at least, you know, in, in a deeper L perspective, it's weird to have costs equal to zero. Usually it's the time dimension that, uh, that appears. Uh, but at least from an analysis point of view, having costs equal to zero makes it very difficult because it means that the two objectives of minimizing the value, the costs and reaching the goal, they, they are completely different. Yeah. But it's application, you can imagine costs are energy and so if the robot's not doing anything, then it achieves zero cost. Ah, you mean, you mean staying staying in a in a self -love. staying place, right? Like just yeah, exactly. Relax, and uh, it's not accomplishing the tasks. So no, I agree. For, yeah, 
not unusual to have this conflict. So uh, I, I agree that having, let's say, if you're staying really in the same, uh, in the you have you're staying in the same state, then it makes sense to have a cost equal to zero. Then interestingly, as we were explaining before, having a self loop with a cost of zero makes it super difficult because, well, the agent may, if you know, if he doesn't have any incentive to reach the goal, it may stay there forever. Yeah. But uh, it's true that it's quite a natural, uh, yeah, it may make sense. Yeah.